Hello, I'm Colin Green, and you are listening to Spike Pit. Just lately, I've been rooting through the archives, and seemingly, episode 36 has caught my old buddy Arlen's imagination. So, he was kind enough to call in, left me a whole bunch of messages, more or less enough to put together a whole episode. It's uh, also got a couple of call-ins from another buddy of mine who's making a few more calls recently really good to hear from rich fraser uh, so i hope you enjoy i'm going to play the messages and cut in here and there where i've got something to say so without any further ado let's get to our callers hey colin it's your boy arlen walker calling in again i have just finished your uh episode 36 kind of new presentation the the episode from the archives that you've uh, republished recently um and i've been kind of going through and i will uh probably be listening to more of spike pit this afternoon as i um work on kind of my own stuff and i have a little bit of uh work work to do and a fair bit of kind of rpg hobby work to do and you know how it is um Anyway, but I really enjoyed the Goliath hunting episode episode. Um, it's, it's really great that you get to play RPGs with the family. Sounds like uh, our fed and the youngest are the ones who are sort of most involved in that uh, with you. But uh, of course, it's really wonderful to get to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and I'm really pleased to say, Arlen, and anybody else who enjoys the family gaming, at one point I was really lucky to have all three of my kids playing at once, and my brother, and a couple of my buddies, and we we had quite a a sizable group, and yeah, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's it's, it's just something different about it, and I think role-playing games can be ideal for for some family gaming if you've got the interested players of course and in in a kind of technological age sitting around a table away from just like family meals and stuff can can be a very rare thing i thought i would add kind of two things which are the things that i specifically wanted to call in about which one of which is the uh, description of the kind of Goliath uh, culture and society, I thought was really cool. It's really, really fun. I think, you know, obviously in a lot of um, our kind of D&D based games, there's a sort of general kind of assumption of a sort of like uh, medieval-ish civilization that exists Often it doesn't have a whole lot to do with kind of actual medieval Europe, but it does have a sort of idea to do with a kind of fancy version of medieval Europe. Um, But I really like the idea of a sort of, you know, a a setting or a world or cultures that are kind of less um, kind of settled medieval and have more of a kind of like Bronze Age or Iron Age or even kind of like pre-metalworking era right a neolithic culture and that's something that unfortunately especially as we get kind of early and earlier into more kind of like neolithic stuff something that i uh, just don't know as much about so i would need to do kind of more research on that i have a pretty good background in kind of bronze age and iron age stuff but as you get kind of early and earlier and it's kind of less uh historical less written historical record and more kind of anthropology and archaeology i don't have as as strong a background in that but i really thought that the the description of the goliath culture and your kind of uh the the kind of hunting the the sort of warrior culture hunting party and sort of nomadic lifestyle element that was really cool and i think it would be really fun to kind of explore more of that in a game you give me a couple of ideas for that and the other thing is i was going to call in to have a uh basically two suggestions about how to handle kind of groups or uh squads in fifth edition um and there i guess I, i might have more than kind of two specific ideas but one way 
is I, I seem to remember that you and I, I can't remember if we just did character creation or if we did any actual play with the uh, Handiwork Games Beowulf Age of Heroes for 5e game. And obviously that did not exist back when episode uh, 036 was recorded. But I think that system works really well for kind of a single hero with a sort of squad. And um, basically for, for any of the listeners who don't know how it works, you can kind of activate as a free action, basically one of often as a free action, sometimes it's not a free action for the hero. You basically have a, the, the player has a sort of hero character that is built kind of like a, an even more powerful basic 5e PC, but then they have a number of followers and the followers don't have kind of full PC stats. They essentially have like one or two special abilities that they can um, be activated by the hero to do those special abilities and they have different roles but um, one of the core ones is that they can um, basically uh, I don't know if all of them can but most of the time what it does is that activating a follower either uh, does something specific or more often it gives the hero advantage on a particular role. So like, you know, trying to recall a particular sort of information, um, you activate your, your learned follower who knows all the old lore and that gives you advantage on your lore check type thing. Um, and in combat, you can do that to um, give, you know, advantage or disadvantage to enemy attacks uh, advantage to your attacks or disadvantage to enemy attacks to kind of be a little more beefy, um, even with basically the, a similar stat array to a kind of normal 5e character. And I think that's a pretty good way to handle something like that. It's not um, necessarily perfect in the sense that it really kind of emphasizes the sort of heroic nature of the hero. So if you wanted more of like one among many, it wouldn't work as well for like if you're you're not necessarily supposed to be the kind of big damn hero yet, that that might not work as well. But for a, a game like Beowulf, where you are the kind of big, larger than life hero surrounded by kind of mere mortals, I think it works really well. Um, the other suggestion, and I'm leaving so many messages, I'm, I'm really sorry for kind of spamming your message inbox, um, and I've lost count of the numbers, so hopefully... I don't have too many uh, duplicate numbers. Um, and now I'm rambling about that instead of saying what I want to say. But um, the other suggestion was something that I have the most experience with, with the Star Wars 5e hack. And that is the way that they do essentially uh, groups of kind of low level, weak uh, characters as a single entity. And I think there's some of that in Vanilla 5e, but I, I'm not as familiar with that particular version. But specifically in the Star Wars 5e hack, they'll have like, you know, a, a squad of like 10 clone troopers or stormtroopers as basically a, a single entity on the uh, the battle map or in the game or whatever. So they make one attack roll and they do damage that is reflective of basically like a couple of soldiers hitting the target. Um, so you don't have to manage like 10 enemies. You just have kind of the one. And then one of the cool things that they do is that they have um, some variable stats based on the kind of condition of the squad in terms of hit points. And the idea being that I don't remember all of the, the rules that they use, but I think sometimes they do like disadvantage on certain checks once the squad is at kind of half or lower hit points and they do um, half damage basically. So they do like, you know, um, 4d8 when they're at kind of full to half hit points and below half hit points they only do 2d8 damage to reflect the idea that um, the squad is just, you know, because they have less shooters, they're not connecting as often. I think that's something that um, 5e kind of doesn't do enough of is the idea of a an enemy uh, that doesn't kind of behave the same way over the entire course of the fight. Um, it's sort of something that I'm more familiar with in, in video games that you have, you know, especially with bosses, often you'll have kind of like boss stages or boss phases where, you know, like the, the boss gets a new kind of set of animations that it uses after you take down half of its health and it becomes, you know, basically angry and tougher. 
but that's uh, that kind of boss phase element is something that you could do with a lot of enemies in something like 5e or any number of RPGs in a lot of ways if you wanted to um, by kind of tinkering with the numbers kind of behind the screen on some level as the, the fight goes on. Um, but I, I liked that idea a lot in the Star Wars 5e hack when I saw it as a way to kind of do that um, pretty straightforward that it's great I think for narrating those kind of scenes where there's you know a bunch of kind of you know nameless faceless troopers just sort of you know all kind of taking pot shots at the the allies and the allies are you know taking shots at them and kind of gradually whittling down their numbers and having some mechanics for that without having to track you know 10 different uh uh, enemies on the field, right? It's a, a sort of simplification of that concept in a lot of ways that I think is really cool. So any basically what you could do is you could have, you know, your kind of main character played by the, the player and then they could have like a, a squad character essentially that as the squad loses hit points, it kind of loses effectiveness to represent, you know, that the some of the, the members of the squad have been wounded or killed. And so, you know, the wounded ones, their buddies are having to, you know, help them along and all of that sort of stuff. And therefore the squad isn't operating at kind of maximum efficiency the way it was at the beginning. So I think that would be a, a kind of fun way to do it. And I, I am looking forward as I get back into 5e in the future of using kind of enemies that do that sort of thing where their kind of effectiveness declines as they take damage or as they get further and further into the fight um, to give the heroes a feel of kind of like making real progress without necessarily finishing off the bad guy type thing. Um, Responding to what Arlen said there, some great stuff and many, many thanks, Arlen. You are right about... Beowulf, we made up a character for myself. Um, you explained the the uh, the kind of company rules, if you like. I, I pictured the sort of Jason and the Argonauts kind of idea, or, or one of these Viking crews. We were we were making an urchin type character for myself, and we were I think we were to and on fro to and froing on whether this urchin would be part of an adult group somehow uh, or or whether it would almost be like a Fagin uh, Oliver Twist type of gang with Fagin and in charge and then these these uh, Dodger and these likely lads as it were forming together but yeah we didn't get around to that and it, that, that was a shame I, I thought there's a lot of potential in that and it, it does tie in with the, that slightly earlier in history getting away from the medieval getting into the dark ages and I, I, I yeah I'm glad you liked the idea of the Goliath game um, one of the things I was particularly happy with was my kind of trapdoor trolls I just saw these spindly in my head for whatever reason I had this idea of these spindly trolls that would lie in wait in the way that a trapdoor spider does and, uh, yeah, the Goliaths went down into one of their tunnels. Um, I'd like to breathe some life back into that again, but my youngest is in with the main group now, and it's always a case of we've got one session a week and we're currently in Barovia doing the Curse of Strahd. Um, who knows when I'll be back in the, the DMing chair. And we, we've we recently, you, you, uh, Arlen mentions the 5e Star Wars squad rules, played been playing those very rules and we never we never seemed to engage with that i didn't even notice them in there i wasn't running the game which is probably the reason for me not noticing it but we were we were much more into a kind of a a stealthy investigation kind of infiltration mission in in uh in bespin and there there wasn't a lot if I'm trying to think, there was barely any combat, so that would explain that. But I will now go back and look at that, or perhaps I'll just speak to Arfed and see if he uh, he remembers seeing that. I do, however, remember some kind of uh, kind of companies of men or small detachment rules in Into the Odd that looked quite fascinating and. They were they were very light as you'd expect for into the odd, 
but quite clever and, you know, of course, I can't remember the details of that either. And the last thing that Arlen was talking about, more or less the last thing, was this idea of when you've got enemies getting injured in an arcade style, it, it changes their ability. And, I, yeah, I agree that 5e is not great at that. And there's a no number of other games, in fact, earlier editions of d and I believe it was 4th. I'm not sure about 3-5 and Pathfinder, but there, there used to be the blooded condition and that would trigger things. And I know uh, 13th Age, obviously, with its influences from uh, former D&D &D designers, it kind of has retained some of that. And I find that a very interesting monster manual for that rule system. But the thing that it, it reminds me of is uh, we used to play a miniatures game using hero clicks figures and uh, had a load of, like, half has got a load of Marvel uh, and superhero type hero clicks and he's got some sci-fi stuff and um, would it be Mage Knight, I believe? I think it was Mage Knight. And with these characters, you've got these swiveling bases and as they turn their their stats change on almost every hit uh you get something a little bit different there's there's a fair like well there's a small small amount of iconography that you have to get your head around but i always thought that was really great to have the stats on the base of a figure and you know as they got damaged you could um sometimes get some rather nasty surprises as special powers would kick in on the enemy side. So, so that was great. And yeah, loads to think about there. And I hope you, the listener, uh, has taken something away from Ireland's contribution. Now, some more stuff. We're talking about domains. And it's uh, Rich Fraser. Domain rules. Ooh, I've been searching for these for a long time. There's a lot of stuff out there, man. They, there is, um, first of all, I want to say uh, Worlds Without Numbers, Stars Without Number. both of those got some really good juicy stuff in it. It's very complicated though. Um, and by complicated, I don't mean it's hard to make sense. I mean, there's a lot of little pieces to it. But this is um, stuff you're doing when the players aren't around. So it's a little more manageable for you, especially if you start with one or two instead of 10. Um, something I've been reading recently and haven't got to that part in yet is errant e-r-r-e-n-t um it it's a, a game that's being worked on the files are out there for you to read there's a website for her um stuff um and it looks pretty good and it's it's a procedural osr game so it's a lot of specific procedures for common things and these are some of my favorite things that have come out of OSR play, um, or that were in OSR play. I don't know. The the, um, the the five E stuff doesn't seem to have those um, those procedures in them. Those step by step. This is what you do. You know. This is what a dungeon turn consists of. That kind of stuff. I really really like that, and I really feel like it's something I can sink my teeth into. My players can get behind and understand, and then we can work through those mechanics together. Um, Aaron is supposed to have all this stuff for like whatever you want to do. Like she was talking in the intro about like getting a lawsuit together and suing people. There's a procedure for it. So there's this whole downtime section where you would do these things. Uh, and so far it's really interesting. The only thing I don't like is the die mechanic. It's D20 roll on under with a um, difficulty value that you have to roll in between. Okay, for that rich hopefully you'll be kind enough to keep us up to date with how you get on in relation to Erin if you're the sort of person that's really not confident in making up loads of rules a it gives you inspiration and b kind of gives you this codified thing if you've if you've got players that like to see things in black and white I, I can understand how it's health uh, helpful to have a, a book like that for me I'm, I'm scaling back a little bit on my purchases i'm always you know really keen to hear what people are up to so that's a, a very enlightening call 
as for the earlier mention at the, the start of your message about stars without number and, and worlds without number, stars without number in particular, I've got some of the tables from that and they're a, a permanent resident in my uh, my DM journal. In fact, it's not my journal. I've got like a little A5 book of stuff that's a kind of appendix to my journal. Uh, the journal is, is more about drawings and ideas and note taking and then I've got a little reference guide that's got all my uh, kind of tables and charts and um, light rule uh, sets, copies of, sort of things like Lasers and Feelings and uh, uh, Ray Otis's Sorcerers and Cell Swords and numerous other games. Now, I'm going to close out the show with a, a final call from Arlen. It's his wrap-up call, and in answer to your question, Arlen, it, it, everything's going fine, mate. I, I, I do at times get a little a little bit overwhelmed with all the training. There's not enough hours in the day, it seems. Really, it's just about prioritising, but sometimes you can have so many things, just the the, the time management and the prioritising of things seems to take up an ungodly amount of your time resource. Once again, then, that's Rich Fraser of Cockatrice Nuggets, Arlen Walker of Live from Pelham's Wasteland. Couldn't have done it without you guys, and hope everybody enjoyed hearing from these familiar old friends. Anyway, so that's sort of a couple of ideas and some commentary about the family thing. Um, I have rambled on for long enough at this point. So I'm going to try to um, finish up here and then I'll listen to some more and we'll probably call in again because I'll have other things to say. Obviously, you don't have to play all of this or any of this. Um, you know, it ends up being, you know, 12 or 15 minutes of Arlen talking on somebody else's podcast sometimes when I do this sort of thing. So um, I'll reach out to you on Discord and we'll figure out something. But anyway, I hope you are doing well. I hope everything is uh, going great for you. I know that the the whole kind of teacher shift has been a little chaotic, but I really hope uh, that it's going well and that you're um, finding yourself in a, in a good place and feeling fulfilled and all that. And um, I'll talk to you soon, man. So take care. And that, as they say, is a wrap. Big thanks goes out to you, the listener, for taking a bit of time out of your day to listen to old Spike Pit. Take care, and I'll catch you later.